Hey guys, alright, um, basically this is going to be another tutorial, uh, and I just wanted to go over a couple things, uh, what you see in, in front of you is just for visual effect, uh, that's it, and uh, I get a lot of emails now and then, and I just want to cover a lot of stuff, this is going to be a, a pretty long tutorial, so if you're interested in this subject, um, you know, how do I make and sell custom knives, uh, you might want to take some notes so you can review back from the video. Uh, I'm not going to be doing anything special except talking. All right. So if it bores you or you already know everything or you know you don't really want to listen to me anymore, that's fine. I don't take offense to it. You can watch it sometime later or not at all. It's up to you. Um, I should say that uh, what I'm going to cover today is uh, a lot of the information and experience that I've learned over the last year or so. Uh, and also I pull from my experiences. Uh, I used to be a, uh, I used to have a business that I ran successfully for a number of years uh, until the economy crushed it and I had to move on to other things. Uh, but my, for my first business, uh, I was in the, I was a contractor, uh, independent tech support specialist, and uh, you name it, I've done it. I've worked with big companies, small companies, little guys, big guys, and I've learned a lot from that. And a knife business is very similar. Business is business, guys. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's the bottom dollar. It's it's uh, the amount of material that you have to order. It's the uh, you know, it's it's your profit margins. It's you know what's coming in, what's going out. Uh, it helps if you have an education in business, but I got to tell you, it's not everything. Okay, you don't need to have a college degree to tell you what's right, what's wrong. Uh, you know when you're being taken advantage of when you should push when you should back off so a little common sense goes a long way so this tutorial that I'm going to cover is basically um, my experiences it is not the only way to do business in the knife industry there's a lot lot got a lot of guys out there that do a lot better business than I do but if you are the um, tinkerer or the um, part-timer knife maker or maybe a hobbyist and you want to sell knives as a side business like I do this video might help you out and that's really what this video is all about so I'm just gonna you know go through what I have and uh, hopefully you guys will learn something and you can share some experiences with me too all right uh, why why do you want to be why, why do you want to make knives and you know it's very simple to say I want to go out and make knives and I want to make a thousand dollars a knife alright honestly it's not gonna happen it's not gonna happen right away you're not you know you're not Ken Onion or, or uh, you know Bobby Loveless or Gil Hibben uh, you need to make a name for yourself but you really need to know within yourself why do you want to make knives is it for extra money is it for side job is it a, are you gonna be a part-time are you a, ho a hobbyist um, is it for your own self-satisfaction? Are you going to make gifts for people? Maybe you're a retired person and you just like to do it as a hobby. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, is it for art? Are you some type of art person that likes to work with steel? Uh, is it for your own ego and self-satisfaction? Are you a designer? Um, are you trying to be the next, you know, Ken Onion, you know, biggest name since uh, sliced bread? Uh, what I'm trying to do is, you know, have your illusions in check okay nobody goes into knife making uh, with with the option to say well I'm gonna go into knife making I'm gonna fail miserably okay it doesn't work that way you want to be the best that you can be and if you do sell some knives that's great but don't be discouraged also don't be delusioned either okay understand that you know this is a very niche market and you really need to build an image build a name for yourself with that being said, you need to come up with your own designs. All right? Do not copy someone else's work. Do not ask to buy somebody else's templates. I get that all the time. Can I buy one of your, your templates? No. To me, it's very personal. When I design a knife, uh, you know, I'm going to put it in CAD and I'm going to send it to my uh, water jet guy or I'm going to take a piece of bar stock, draw it on paper, glue it to the bar stock and cut it out. That's the creative process. If you're not a creative person, then maybe knife making isn't for you because everything you do is is creating something you're creating something out of a piece of steel whether it be a plate of steel or a bar of steel if you don't have that in you and you want to rush 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 maybe knife making is not for you okay and, and and I mean that 
with my own biased opinion, but I know a lot of knife makers that are artists and that's what you want to strive for. The money will come once you've gotten through all the hardships and you know the burnt fingers and and you know all that stuff but you really need to truly be an artist and a craftsman to your craft and respect um, the designs that you're making if you're copying somebody else's work it's not yours anymore okay the who who is your target audience obviously Custom knife making is a niche business, okay? It's not, do not go and put your stuff in catalogs. I get emails all the time about somebody from overseas that wants to sell all my stuff and they show me all this great stuff that they're selling. I'm not selling my products overseas, number one, because I can't handle the, you know, they want a thousand copies of this. I couldn't handle that. So be, be realistic about it. Are you selling to military? Are you selling to survivalists? Are you selling to hunters, police? outdoorsmen, search and rescue, martial artists, businessmen, construction or linemen? Are you selling to uh, fantasy people, fantasy guys, you know, guys that like fantasy blades? Uh, you know, America is very uh, specialized or eccentric when it comes to uh, the use of their knives. We're very separated. Now, if you go to Malaysia or Taiwan or some other place where uh, one bolo knife is your kitchen knife, your machete, uh, your surgeon's knife. It's a lot different here in America. We like to specialize our knives. And you need to understand that if you're going to sell your knives, who you're selling to, who's your market. Uh, you know, are, are you trying to sell, you know, big buoy knives to, you know, cowboys? You're trying to sell EDCs uh, to guys that work every day in the city? Uh, you might want to think about, you know, who, who, who's your niche? Uh, and also, you need to design your styles around that. Every person, every knife maker I ever met has a different style to an EDC, to a Bowie knife, to a Bolo. Everybody has it different because that's, like I said, that's the artist within you. What are you going to sell? All right. Are you going to sell large knives, big knives? Are you going to sell folders, autos? Are you going to sell swords, machetes? you know, fantasy knives, axes, hatchets, breaching tools, uh, you know, once you figure out who you're going to sell to, what type you're going to sell them, all right? I myself only make fixed blades because I don't have the tools or the material yet to make folders. Uh, you know, I can make folders, but they're more time consuming. It's a lot easier for me to hone my craft on something I'm good at. It doesn't mean that I won't try it at a certain time. I will. I absolutely will try to make folders, but I think any beginning knife maker should uh, start with the straight blades. Get used to it, get comfortable with the grinder, Lo know what you're doing, and then move on to another uh, uh, another project. Uh, also, uh, are you going to sell sheets? Are you going to sell? Are you going to work with leather? Are you going to sell, you know, Kydex, nylon, Condora? Are you going to sell accessories with your sheets? Are you going to sell fire steels? Are you going to sell uh, belt attachments? All these things kind of come into play because, uh, you know, it's not, you know, somebody said that the bane of every knife maker's uh, issue is the sheath. And you're right. I know that I can make Kydex sheets, but I can't make leather sheets because it's too time consuming. All right. Time is a huge factor with me. I only have two, three days a week to make knives. So if I have to uh, spend an exuberant amount of time on making sheets, then I am stopping myself from selling a knife to somebody else, okay? So sometimes I make Kydex, sometimes I buy the nylons. If somebody requested, I could buy uh, Condora and, you know, the tactical molly sheets and then just put that into the price, okay? You can buy them online anywhere. You just Google it. So that's something you need to think about. Not only, you know, what you're making, but what you're going to carry it in, okay? All right, when? When will you? All right, when are you going to have time to make knives? I, I, it's very simple to say, hey, you know what? I'm single. Uh, I'm going to work out of my dad's garage and it's great. Well, you know, it doesn't always work that way. You know, you got to think about uh, what time of the day can you make knives? If you work all day and then you come home 
or you go to school all day and then you come home and then you're grinding till two in the morning and your parents are going to kill you or your neighbors are calling the cops because now you pass the noise uh, i think city ordinance ordinance has a noise uh law here in the city it's 10 to 10. so 10 a.m till 10 p.m you can make noise after that they'll call the cops on you and you'll have to stop something to think about you know what's your timeline for uh uh, you know, be realistic is all I'm saying. You know, find out where you're going to work, uh, when you're going to work, what time is feasible for you, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, what's your timeline for vendors or suppliers? Okay, when? When? You can order stock, uh, bar stock, and it might not come in for weeks. Maybe they ran out and they didn't tell you. Okay, so now you have enough steel to make your knives, but you ordered something two weeks ago and it's still not in. All right, what's your timeline? Be realistic, understand the way they work. Maybe that steel vendor's not for you. Uh, your time for heat treat. I send all my knives out because I like to outsource it. It gives me time to do other things. And while that stuff is out at heat treat, not only is it being done professionally and I don't have to worry about fire inside my little uh, shop and fire ordinance, I don't have to worry about that. It already gets taken care of. Um, but now I have time to do other stuff. All right, same thing with water jet time it's all about time if I'm sending my blades out to get water jetted I know it's going to take him three to four weeks for him to get me back 20 80 60 blades in that timeline I cannot promise somebody else a knife I need to wait a month then add on the time to grind them then add on the time to heat treat okay this is all time uh, and then the time to ship to customers all right what I usually do is I guesstimate about how much time it's going to take to cut blanks, heat treat them, bevel them, get them coated, make the sheath for it, and then I get an estimated time of what it is. After that, the ship date. I always bump up the ship date, all right? I don't want to be short. So if I know it's going to take me two months to get it all back from my vendors and grind it out and do the stuff that I need to do, then I'm going to add on a couple weeks, maybe even a month. Because this way, i rather sell a blade when I said I was going to ship it than have to tell the customer that you spent all this money and there was a delay with the vendor. They don't care about the vendor. They care that they bought a knife from you and you promised them a time. And now that time is not going to happen. So that's, that's the sure way of losing uh, customers. Uh, time to collect the money. All right. I like to collect the money up front. Some people do not. Uh, you'll find some knife makers, they might take a deposit, other knife makers do not. It all depends on what you feel. I feel that if I have the money in the bank, I can use that towards the vendors, towards making more knives, towards steel, and then, you know, I know that you're not going to, you know, that, that customer is not going to go away. I know that because I have your money. Once I have your money, now it's up to me to get you your product. Okay, it's very simple. And the fact of the matter is that I use PayPal. So if the, if the customer ever feels that I'm not doing the right thing, PayPal has a system where they can uh, dispute the charge and then we go back and forth in litigation. So they're still protected. All right. How? How? Okay. How's a big one? All right. How are you going to make your knives? All right. Is it going to be forging? Is it going to be stock removal? Forging is awesome. I have nothing against forging. I wish that if I didn't live in the city, I would have a forge. Okay. However, for, forging your blades will add more time. Okay. There also there's a lot of fire and noise uh, issues that you got to worry about inside the city. If you live in a city in the country, it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, you got to set up your area. It's got to be fire resistant, uh, child free. You have to have uh, certain tools, certain gases. If you're going to go coal, you got to buy coal. So it's, it's more of an expense. Although I appreciate a forged blade because I know where the strength is coming from and I have done the research and I think they look better. Uh, I don't have the option of doing that. All right. But you might stock removal. Okay, if you're going to do stock removal, is your place set up for it? Is your shop uh, set up electrically? Can it handle the workload? I blow breakers all the time, so I have to change um, 
you know, I might have to change a couple breakers. I might have to add a 220 line. Uh, some machines run on 220, not 110, which is the, the normal household. Uh, you might not be able to run your grinder, uh, you know, eight days a week, you know, seven days a week and holidays and weekends because now your electric bills through the roof. The location of your shop, okay, uh, the proper amperage, you know, where's your shop? Is it outdoors? Is it indoors? You know, stuff like that. Uh, proper ventilation, dust, noise, uh, you know, is it shared? You know, maybe you want to rent some space in some other uh, industrial place maybe his time you know security or whatever doesn't work for you you know proper ventilation be safe about this um, tools the how the how you know what to buy first okay so now you're making money you're a knife maker uh, you know how am I gonna purchase this next item do I really need a sandblast cabinet or should I buy more belts because I'm running out of belts you know these are the things you gotta think about uh, stock materials your steel vendors you know how much steel are you going to need? How much do you think you need? Uh, you know, how much, you know, money is it going to cost me for the water jet, the heat treat, and all that other stuff? Right? When it comes to expenses, listen, I'm not, I'm not a financial wizard or, or an accountant at all, but you need to keep records, all right? And if PayPal has a great system there, but sometimes you sell stuff on the side. Uh, you can use an Excel spreadsheet. You can use QuickBooks. If you're going to sell blades, I know most knife makers hate this part, and I hate this part. I hate it in my other business as well, but you need to keep records. Uh, I'm not saying that you got to report everything to the IRS. I am not a tax guy. You do what you feel is right. If you're going to do it for cash, that's on you, all right? But you need to keep a record to protect yourself uh, against any clients or any type of litigation. Okay. Uh, you know, certain things also, you know, you have to have a balance sheet. You need to know what's coming in. You need to know what's going out. What's your profit margin. Okay. Certain things like, uh, you know, some people ask me, you know, I want to start with files. Should I start with files or hardened steel or this and that? Listen, if you're first starting out, buy cheap tools. Okay. Don't go crazy. Go to Harbor Freight, buy you one by 30. You know, buy a couple files, you know, you can get a nice vice used, you can buy used stuff, there's nothing wrong with that. And the idea behind that is, you don't want to put a huge investment into something that you might not like, okay? If you don't like dust in your face, cutting your fingers, burning your hands, wearing respirators, you know, you just spent, don't go out and spend $2,000 on a grinder if you have never grinded before. Most people, what they do is they start out with the 1x30, then they go to Grizzly, uh, the, the, it's like a Grizzly, I think it's 1015 is the number, and it's a great starter, uh, you know, it's a one speed, it, you know, it's got a, uh, I get, forget what it is, but it's, it's a 2x72, it's about $600 shipped. And then from there, if you're still knife grinding, then you could go on to the bigger machines. But don't go out and buy a two thousand dollar grinder if you haven't even grind anything yet. Uh, covered tracking your bills, your expenses, pay your bills, uh, make a spreadsheet. Vendors, um, if you're doing water jet, like I said, you're gonna have to pay the vendors up front. They're not gonna ship your steel if you owe them six, seven hundred dollars. Um, so if you're not gonna cut it yourself, you need to have that money waiting. So as soon as you get a check and you cash it, hold on to your money. Don't go out and spend it on a Nexus Suspenza or whatever knife or, or, or go buy 20 pieces of stock steel. Understand that there might be some issues. Always have something in the kitty just in case of emergencies. Okay. Um, and then there's the thing of, you know, how much do I charge? Okay. This has been a huge controversy. Some people charge by the hour. Some people charge by, you know, material and by hourly or by labor uh, and it really depends on you okay some people charge by the design you know it, there's just so many ways of doing it I read something where somebody said uh, and it was a, it's a great knife maker he's, he's very famous I can't remember his name right now but he said you know charge uh, if you're charging um, twenty dollars an hour and it took you twenty you know ten hours to do it it's two hundred dollars double it that's four hundred dollars for a knife all right Maybe in his arena where he's a well-known knife maker, you can do that. 
But if you just got into knife making and you're trying to make a name for yourself and your quality is not that good yet, you cannot charge $400. No one's going to buy it. Um, you got to be reasonable. Okay. So let's say this blade right here. Let's say, I, and this is by no means, this is not the, uh, the, the actual cost, but let's say this blade right here, the materials, the heat treat, the grind, you know, all that stuff, just the materials itself. Okay. The materials itself cost, um, $50. Okay. So you say $50 just to make simple math. Then you say the labor, okay. The labor, let's say I charge $10. It took me 20, 20, you know, 20 hours to do. So that's $200, right? That's 250. So I know at this point, $250 is what I need to break even on that knife. Now for profit, I charge plus 30%. That's $325. You made 30% off that. Why do you charge 30%? Some people are like, oh, well, you should charge 50% or 60 or 70. Well, 30% is what I know at my skill that I can get for that knife. Okay. Now you also have to take into effect uh, take into consideration how much the light bill is, the electric bill, the extra, um, you know, any type of materials, the suppliers, all that stuff costs money. So if you're not charging 30% or higher, you're losing money and that's why you need a balance sheet. Okay. You can't charge, uh, what it costs to make and then think that you're going to make any money to pay for the other stuff, you'll be out of business tomorrow. If you want to charge 40%, let's say you go into a knife show. Every time you go to a knife show, they charge up. Why do you think they charge up? They're charging more of a percentage because they got to pay for the booth. Not only that, but they expect you to haggle with them. Okay. So the prices on the website or the prices at the booth are always going to be higher because you want some wiggle room. So you might charge an extra 40%, 50% just to make your money back. So I hope that kind of helps, gives you a little bit of an idea of what to charge. Again, it's going to have to do with, uh, you know, your niche, who you're selling to, what kind of knife it is, all that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, 30% to me is right about where it's, it's easy. I know I could sell the blades. And like I said before, the biggest thing I want to tell you is steel on the bench is not money in the bank. Okay. doesn't matter how great your knives are. If they're still sitting on the bench, there's not money in your bank account. All right. The next thing is uh, shipping. All right. Shipping, shipping and returns. You need to document and dis and all you need to document all your disclaimers, legal shipping procedures on your website, in paperwork, anywhere that it's there, blasted all over the place. Don't make it obtrusive, but make sure it's easy to read. Okay. Educate your customers. All right. Make sure that they know what your policies are. All right. Don't be rude. Don't turn them off, but make sure they know, Hey, look, you know, I just spent 40 hours on a knife and because you didn't like one thing, you want your money back. That's not my policy. My policy is A, B, C, D, and this is what my policy is. And you know, you know, now you have a legal leg, leg to stand on. Okay. Also make sure in certain areas, you're not allowed to sell certain blades, uh, such as here in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, you're not allowed to have double edge knives. I don't know why they call them daggers. You're not allowed to have them. You can't make them, can't sell them, can't have them. You go to jail. You can't sell to under 18 years old. Make sure you put that in your disclaimers, educate your customers. All right. Also educate them on the wait time. Okay. What I like to do is to say, and you know, also what I do is I, inf I, I tell them about how much inventory I have. So if I'm educating them on my wait time, my inventory, my procedures and shipping, my disclaimers, it is now up to the customer to read that. If they don't read that, which most people don't, that's fine. But as long as you educated them, you are now protecting yourself. The last thing you want to do is to sell a knife to somebody that's, you know, not the right person. And then you have the marshals knocking on your door. Okay. Or the cops knocking on your door. I sell knives for, like I said, because I have a passion. It's a great hobby. I learn a lot from it. I like working with it and I make a little extra money. That's all it is. If I have to shut down production 
because somebody got hurt with one of my knives or something happened, then I'm going to feel terrible, but I'm also going to have to face a lawsuit. Okay, so it might not be bad to, to maybe get some insurance as well. All right, but just educate your customers, know what they're doing, you know, try to, try to be as pleasant as possible because nobody likes to read anyway. All right, marketing and advertising. Do not take ads out in the paper. You are a niche marketer, okay? Not everybody needs a $300 Bowie knife. Okay, understand that. If you put an ad in the paper or a sign somewhere, hey, look at my knives, no one's going to care except the people that follow you, okay? The idea behind YouTube and social networking and social media like For Facebook people to and come and see what you're doing and possibly buy from you. That's what you want. You want to create a following. Uh, you don't want to create a cult, but you want to create a following, someone that likes your stuff and wants to come and buy it. All right? But utilize that, you know, stay as small as long as possible. In other words, you don't have to go crazy. Most of the stuff that you can do, you can do by yourself. YouTube, eBay, forums, blogs, website, all that stuff you can do for free or virtually free. Uh, let people know who you are, showcase your work and have people find out what you're doing. You can do Twitter. There's nothing wrong. I have a Twitter account. Go check it out. I have a Google Plus account. I barely check it. You know, I know when people are on it and they, they respond to me, I can read my email, but some people don't like doing Facebook, but they like doing Twitter. So create an account. It's free. It costs you nothing. If you create a YouTube video, post it on every single Facebook. That's niche because people will only come and watch you that want to watch you, that want to learn from you, that want to see your stuff and possibly buy it. Okay. Uh, do not rely on one source to sell, but sell only in one place at a time. All right, so what I mean by that is if you're selling your knives on YouTube or eBay and then you decide you want to sell them on a blog, but it's the same exact knife, um, if somebody buys it in one area and then buys it in another area and it's only one knife, you now screwed the pooch. So only sell a knife on, let's say, you know, for three weeks, you try to sell it on the forums, it didn't sell. Then you sell it on YouTube, it didn't sell. Then you sell it on eBay, it didn't sell. All right, well, maybe it'll sell on Facebook, boom, it sold. All right, so here's how it works. Don't oversell your product. You know, it is what it is. Not everybody's gonna see it at one time. Also understand when you are posting a video or a blog or whatever it is, most people get home uh, after work around six o'clock, six, seven o'clock east, you know, wherever you are. That's the best time to post a video because they just got home from work, they just ate, and at night they're going to come and watch your videos. All right, it's a little trick, it's a little marketing trick. Why do you think you get emails at, you know, 4:30 in the morning and you get them at four or four, five, six o'clock at night? It's a marketing trick. They know when you're getting up in the morning and they want you to see that email as soon as you pop it on, or you're coming home from work and you just got home and you're going to pop on that email or check your Twitter account. They know that. You know it, use it. Use it to your advantage. Marketers are not stupid, they're smart, and that's what you do. Um, make it easy to buy, okay? I, can't say, I cannot say this enough. It is so much easier to use PayPal. I know there's a lot of people against PayPal. Well, they take your information and all the, who cares? You get your money, they take a percentage out. If you want, you can get a credit card, you know, credit card uh, account. I think that they're, you gotta pay for that as well. But I know, most people are impulse buyers and so does the rest of the world we're americans we like our stuff and we want it now we don't want to wait to go to the post office to get a money order to wait till payday so then i could ship it to you hey listen if you're security conscience and that's the only way you can do it i offer that service no problem send me a, a you know a bank check or, or a postal money order i'll wait i don't care i have all the time in the world i'm the knife maker if you want to buy it fine buy it send me cash i don't care but most people, they're going to pull out that debit card, they're going to pull out that uh, credit card, and they're going to buy. And if you're not set up to accept it, they're going to get past you over in 10 seconds. I think uh, the average person browses a website or a page for around 8 to 10 seconds, maybe even less. Okay, 8 to 10 seconds, you got to sell them something. And if they're not on it, you're out. All right, use seasonal uh, sales. Okay, use seasonal sales. Christmas is coming up. We just had Black Friday. We're going to have Cyber Monday. You're going to have Halloween. 
Veterans Day. You're a knife. You're a knife maker, but you're also a knife salesman. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you know, you can do charity events. All right, you can do, um, you know, any type of church or 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 you can do a, uh, um, uh, you know, knife shows or gun shows. The idea behind this is to get exposure. You need exposure. People need to know who you are and they need to appreciate your work. If you're sitting in your basement grinding out steel and YouTube is your only outlet to sell a knife, you're not going to sell very many knives. You're going to get frustrated and you're going to give up. Okay? Because you're not selling. You're, you're buying. You're buying steel and it's not going anywhere. Get it off your bench. Get people to see it. Make business cards. All right? You don't have to make fancy flyers. You can go to, I think it's uh, Vista Print and print out a cheap box for $30 or less of free shipping. So that's all you need. Business cards. Get your logo going if you want. You definitely need a website. And if not a website, get a free blog where you can showcase your work. They're free. All right, education. Education is probably one of the most important things that is the most least talked about because it is pretty dry. But when I first started making knives, I watched a lot of YouTube videos. Now, I don't know if you know why I started making knives, but the bottom line is that I've, I've always been a craftsman in my whole life. Uh, I started with carpentry, I went to cement work, uh, you know, my grandfather was a laborer, my brother's a laborer, my father is a plumber. So obviously, I have trade skills growing up, okay? Not everybody has that. but. When I started looking into knife making, I watched a lot of YouTube videos and I got interested. Then what I did is I went out and I bought movies. Uh, that there's a lot of, there's like three or four really good guys that you can, you know, how to flat grind, how to hollow grind, uh, you know, sheath making. You can, you can go to knifekits.com and buy them off the website or you can download them. I don't care what you do. But these are masters, ABSs, okay? And these are you know, blacksmiths, forgers, whoever it is, and they learned and they are training people. You got to buy the video because you don't want to copyright. You buy the video and you watch it and learn. Uh, I was also given a couple blacksmith books that I read religiously. Uh, I read Carter's book. Uh, I read um, uh, Loveless's book. I also watched his videos. Uh, Good Goodwin's book. I read. I read like an animal, like a soaking up a sponge. Some people don't like to read. But if you don't educate yourself, you stop learning. And if you stop learning, you're not doing anything better. You always want to be able to to learn more. Um, you know, the time that you believe that you've learned it all is when you stop progressing. Okay. Every time I grind a blade, I learn something more about myself. I learn about the way I handle the knife. I learn how the blade worked. I learned how the belt grinder's working. I learned that, you know, maybe I should have cut this way or cut that way. You always constantly learn it. You have to practice. There's no knife maker in the world that after he's made a knife and sat down for two months is gonna get up on the grinder and do a perfect grind. I've never seen it. It doesn't happen. You, the best knife makers in the world do it for because they have a passion for it. They love doing it. They love getting in there, getting dirty. You know, I know knife makers and even myself, I went without eating for eight hours because I couldn't get this grind right. Okay. Which brings on another thing. Um, learn, learn when to stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, know when to stop. And that's part of the learning process is learn your body. Learn when you need to stop for lunch. Learn when you need to drink water, stay hydrated. I do all my grinding standing up. Uh, I know a lot of knife makers that do it sitting down because of their age. So that also will take a factor. You know, if your shoulders hurt and your neck hurts because you're constantly looking and bending over your grinder, maybe you need to lift your grinder up a little bit, or maybe you need to get a bench and sit down and figure out how that works too. Again, education. Okay, lastly, words of wisdom, guys. This is the last part, words of wisdom. I know you're probably bored to tears right now, but I'm going to finish it up by saying these couple things, all right? If you're a new knife maker or any knife maker, start small. Stay small as long as you possibly can, okay? If you see that your work's getting better, you can, you can, add, you can add your equipment and your stuff later. Make small knives, 
okay at first make small knives you don't need to make big animal dinosaur killers uh, make small knives at first it's easier to make they're easier to handle and they're easier to sell and the materials are cheaper okay you can buy a, a, a piece of slab of micarta if it's you know 10 you know 20 bucks 20 30 dollars and make it last you can put like three four four knife handles on there if you get one of these big choppers right here you just have to split it in half and now you burned your money okay so stay small learn your trade uh, the smaller the knife the better you know, uh, it doesn't have to be a neck knife. Don't be convinced that neck knives are the best thing in the world. Learn your, learn your trade, stay small. Do not rely on others. Do not take on partnerships or do collaboratives or trust your vendors. Okay, might sound crazy, right? You have to be confident in your timelines before you do anything. All right, I made the mistake. I did a couple collaboratives. They never worked out. Okay, you are not Ken Onion. You're not. You know, if you're just starting out, you're not at that level. Now, if CKRT knocks on your door, yeah, do a collaborative. If you know Sog Knives knocks on, yeah. But if Joe Schmo from Training Company X decides that they want to do a collaborative and they have no funding, they have no backing, they don't have their own uh, CAD guys, they don't have their own machines. It's probably not going to work out. I'm just just letting you know. As a favor, as a friend, you want to do a collaborative? That's great. As long as there's no money being passed, fine. You want to do a favor? You want to see what you guys can mix up? It's an experimental or an R&D? Absolutely. No problem. No money being passed. Hey, let's design this together. But if you're going to do it for profit, you need to be with a well-established company. That's all I'm saying. That's a word of advice there. All right. Um... Buy used or cheap tools at first, all right? Uh, you don't have to go crazy spending a lot of money, all right? You can, get, you can make knives with a, with a file and a, and a hammer uh, and a vise. That's all you need. I mean, it's really that simple. Um, so you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, there's a great book out, $50 Knife Shop. Um, go, it's, go get it on Amazon. If you don't believe me, believe me. This guy has jerry-rigged everything, and it, it's a fantastic book. Um, also, you may not like it, you know, you may not like knife making. It's a dirty job. It's, it's dirty, you know, my, I, after I do uh, a day of grinding, my hands hurt, my feet hurt, my back hurts, my face hurts from having a respirator on, my eyes are strained, my ears are ringing, so, you know, even with all the protection on, it's still a taxing on your body, okay? Um, Keep your patience and your ego in check. You cannot rush steel. Okay, be flexible. If you're, like I said, learn learn when to stop. Don't rush steel. Don't rush the process. If you're rushing and you're grinding, you're gonna grind your knives into toothpicks. You're gonna get upset. You're gonna throw it on the side. I give up. That frustration is gonna kill you. All right. Making knives should not be stressful. It should be an art. It should be a passion of yours. You should want to give your knives to somebody that's going to appreciate it and send you thanks. Words of praise. Words of praise mean more to me than money. If somebody sent me a blade, uh, I think it was a houndsman, I sent them a blade. And it was some of my earlier work, which wasn't that great, but he did a fantastic review. But I don't think it even deserved that review. But one of the best things was is that his son and him went on a trip to Alaska and he took pictures with the knife out in Alaska. He took that knife from the States uh, up to Alaska to use as his primary uh, edge weapon and cooking knife or whatever. Fantastic. Awesome story. All right. Uh, be flexible. All right. Nothing ever works the way it should when you're working with steel. And again, you cannot rush steel. Uh, prioritize your builds. Make your life easier. Okay. When I first started making knives, I was all over the place. I made a couple knives. I, you know, listen, there's a couple ways to make and sell blades. Some people take pre-orders like I do. Some people only make knives that they can sell. So they'll make one knife, they'll finish it up, they'll sell it, they'll take that money, buy another knife, buy more steel, more product, make another knife, sell it, and go on from there. So they'll only sell what they have in their hand completed. That's not a bad way to go. That's an excellent way to go especially if you're new to knife making. 
if you want to make multiple knives, now you have to worry about, um, you know, are you going to grind them all yourself? Are you going to send them all to heat treat? Uh, are you going to uh, send them to a water jet company all together? All right. So you got to prioritize. What I'm doing right now is I'm going to have a production line and then I'm going to make some of the stuff that I like and sell that as an odd lot or some of the, you know, or, or as a, an added bonus. Uh, I used to take custom orders. I stopped taking custom orders specifically because of the time. I cannot make production knives and get my word out there while I'm making somebody else's build. Okay. That is nothing against custom knife makers, like guys that take custom orders. I think custom orders are fantastic because I get a lot of ideas from them. But when it gets to the point where a custom order uh, takes over the majority of your, your, your process or your time, now you're running into profits. Because I know if I have 20 of these and I know exactly how long it takes me to make them, I know exactly how long it takes to heat treat, put the handles on and to sell them, then I could gauge how much money I'm going to make. But if I take a custom knife, and I work on it and I go back and forth with the, you know, with the dealer or the customer and I go back and forth and he likes this, take this out, take pictures back and forth. Now I'm eating up a lot of profits. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that process. There's nothing wrong with taking, uh, that time out to work with custom stuff. You just have to understand where your money is and how much you want to make and how you want to make it. All right. Uh, lastly, Find a balance between family, work, and play. Enjoy it. Don't kill the artist in you. All right? Very, very simple. Uh, like I said, the reason I'm prioritizing my blades is because I want to have more time for my friends, my family. And, I, you know, working seven days a week is not enjoyable to anybody. Believe me. I'm the type of person that, you know, if you order for a knife from me, my priority is to get that knife to you as soon as humanly possible. Again, I have to worry about vendors. I have to worry about heat treat. I have to figure stuff out. So it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of stuff. But if you're not taking care of your home, you're not taking care of your family, you know, you, you, you're basically invisible when you're home, that's not helping anybody out. So find time for that. All right. Don't kill yourself. If you have everything written down and you have a timeline and you have a schedule, stick to your schedule. Make sure your clients or customers are educated on your schedule. So if I told you three months and you're calling me in three weeks, it's not your fault. It's the client's fault because you educated them. Make sure they know what they're expected to know. All right. So that's pretty much it. I hope I, co I know I covered a lot and I hope I didn't ramble too much. Uh, I hope for new knife makers, uh, this will help you to make your own, um, system to sell your blades. I hope you're very profitable and I hope everybody out there that wants to make knives has the uh the ability to do so you know listen just just do it you know with the guidelines and the notes that you just took i hope that it helps you to um become better knife makers all right that's it go to threeriverblades.com um stay safe out there Out.